If you own a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, you're going to want to stay tuned to this video because I'm going to show you five different upgrades that you might want to consider doing to your SCT. Almost exactly one year ago, I helped my friend Dave tear down his 11-inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope from Celestron, just like this one I have here, so that he could do a number of improvements to his telescope. Now, I also videotaped the entire process at the time. And because there was so much video material, I've broken that all up into three different videos. I've already published the first two. The first one is a complete teardown video showing you step-by-step -step how to tear down your Celestron SCT. Also, during the process of the teardown, Dave discovered a problem with the hardware that comes with the Celestron motorized focuser, which both he and I do use. And that evolved into an entire video of its own explaining exactly what the problem is, which can cause binding of the focus motor, which I've observed on my own telescope with the Celestron motorized focuser. But it can also lead to excessive mirror flop not mirror shift when you're focusing, but just mirror flop as the telescope transitions across the sky. So that's a whole nother video. And if you're interested in that, again, I'll put another link up here to that video and you can go take a look at it. But in this video, we're gonna discuss the five different upgrades that Dave did to his telescope. Now, exactly what are these five improvements Dave decided to make to his telescope? See, Dave's an avid amateur astronomer, and the further he gets into it, the more detailed he gets into issues that prevent him from making the best photos that he would like to make. And one of the biggest concerns he has, and those of us who own SCTs all have encountered this, is mirror flop. And that's when, because we focus these telescopes by moving the primary mirror, there has to be a little bit of slop in the way the mirror is mounted in there and moves so that you can do the focusing. And the mirror slides on a, a set of baffle tubes, one inside the other. And Dave did some research and found that other people have tried to address some of the play in the two baffle tubes by drilling holes in the baffle tube and inserting some nylon screws between the outer tube and the inner baffle tube to take out some of that play. So that was the primary reason for tearing down his telescope and making modifications. But once he was inside there, he realized he could do some other improvements. So as you will see in this video, he also added temperature sensor, which he applied to the primary mirror itself. He added some cooling fans. He also added some baffles to try and create a laminar flow across the face of the mirror. He replaced the lube that comes stock with these telescopes with a much better, higher performance lube. And finally, he flocked the inside of the tube itself. So, those are the five improvements that he made. So without any further ado, let's let Dave tell his own story. Okay, so we're gonna, in the front on the baffle tube, we're gonna use 1032 nylon screws according to the plan, and we'll see how that works out. And I have a new drill and tap to make that all work smoothly. And then behind the mirror, I'm planning to use 832 at the moment because the clearances are not quite as good, and we'll see if that works out. I'm also going to replace all of the grease on the baffle tube and on the focusing nut of the mirror, which, and I'm going to use this Crytox uh, ELP grease, which costs about 100 bucks for a two ounce tube. So it's very expensive, but it's also very high performance. It's very low vapor pressure, has a wide temperature range of use. It's inert chemically, so it won't interact with anything, and it's a preferred grease if you're willing to pay the money. In addition to the mirror corrections, I'm going to work very hard to get better thermal control of the telescope. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add fans for push-pull. So there's going to be two fans. Uh, on the inside of the telescope, I'm going to mount these on the vent holes of the C11 Edge HD. Uh, these fans I were recommended by other people on cloudy nights. I compared several 
different companies and these were very easily obtained and they were not so expensive like 15 bucks a piece and they have uh, speed modifications if you want to do that technique I think I'm going to run this at the highest speed available and it will actually exchange the air in the C11 with these two fans in about 15 seconds or so um, so it's a good exchange rate I'm also going to try and use the flow of the fans to break up boundary layers on the mirror if I can direct the air correctly to be able to do that I need to have a power in and out of the of the scope because I'm going to run these on the inside so I'm planning to use this uh, panel connector through the back plate of the telescope for plugging into a 12 volt supply and this cabling is just what I'm using to get into my 12 volt supply system. In addition to running the fans for cooling the inside I'm also now going to start monitoring very carefully the uh, temperature of the mirror and the external temperature. So the, the Yocto Medio V2 is I'm going to be mounting it on the inside onto the mirror directly through the some plates in the back. We'll see where that goes yet. And this device is allows you to separate the sensor from the electronics if you wish. And I probably will do that. And then we'll have a panel connector of this mini USB. That's the way you connect to this uh, temperature humidity gauge. And that's going to go into the back plate of the telescope and then connect with the mini USB into the uh, temperature sensor itself. And then this other temperature station, which um, both of these come from Switzerland and they both, after you pay shipping, cost about 105 bucks each. Um, this will be the external temperature system for comparing the ex environmental temperature to the mirror temperature on the inside. And both of these, the important aspect of them is they're ASCOM compatible. And so what you're seeing on the screen right now is on the left side, you're seeing the Yocto Pus temperature gauge running through the GSP, the um, generator sequence, sequence generator. Oh, I messed this up. It's okay. <laughs> the sequence generator plus SGP is on the left, and it's running through ASCOM. And the one on the right is the uh, Astro Me, which is now running um, directly and not through ASCOM, but it also runs through ASCOM as well. I've tested them both. So they both are ASCOM compatible. And in fact, these are the only two small uh, weather stations I could find that had ASCOM compatibility as well as USB compatibility for plugging into the, the guide or plugging into the uh, sequence generator software, which requires ASCOM compatible so uh, units. <laughs> So the primary objective in the whole teardown process was to see what we could do to correct any slop in the mirror, particularly flop or drift or, or bad clearances. As I mentioned in one of my other short parts of the video, when we took it apart, we found that the clearance on the inside of this baffle to the inner baffle of the back plate is actually very good. It's only about a thousandth of an inch clearance at the top and the bottom and there's a ring at the top that has the close clearance and there's a ring at the bottom that has the close clearance and in the middle there's a little bit of a recess and where we're going to work on the improvement is the recess but before I tell you any more I'm going to put my cover plate over this because I want to keep the mirror protected throughout this process and we'll keep this plate in place while we're doing the drilling operation and the tapping operation so what we're going to do is we're going to put two screws along the axis of the, the nut plane down as low as we can make it with clearance for the drill and then put another one that's one inch higher and do the same thing at 90 degrees. And both, all four of those screws are going to be in the recessed part of the inside of the baffle tube and we're not going to disturb the close fit regions of the baffle tube. We're only going to disturb the region in between where there's lots and lots of clearance and so in case there's a little distortion from the drilling operation we're not going to do damage to the close clearance regions of the baffle tube. So the next step is going to be to mount this up and start doing some drilling and we'll show you that in the next part of the video. Okay so here's how we're going to do these drill and tap operations. Um, few special parts were purchased. I bought this V-block for about 21 bucks so that I could actually clamp this in place. The V-block's in my vise to give me a good firm base. And I have a C-clamp uh, that I can clamp then the baffle tube into the V-block and I don't want to press it too hard so I don't distort the shape. 
Then I bought a drill guide for about 20 bucks and it's now positioned on the tube where I'm going to drill the first hole and I'm going to use the number 21 drill for the 1032 screw that we're going to tap into position and later I'm going to use the tapping block in place of the drill block to do the guide for the tapping. So I think we put a little oil in the guide or the drill guide block and we put a little oil on the bit of the drill and I think we're about ready to go. Okay, so we finished drilling and tapping the four holes. I would say it was a little rugged and the alignment's not perfect, but actually it's probably more than sufficient for what we're trying to accomplish. And so we now have four black nylon screws at 1032 dimension with lock nuts and lock washers. And once we reassemble, we're gonna be able to then adjust the tension on this to try and tighten it up a little bit more. And then we're done with this operation. So while I was deciding to do all of the different upgrades to the telescope, I decided I would flock the inside tube as long as I had everything torn apart. And I found from a company called Protostar a very premier material that you can use inside for flocking. That's exactly what it's for. And his recommendation is you cut this into strips. So I've actually cut this into six strips and put them in one at a time. And if you've got good eyes, you can almost see one of the seams but this actually worked out very well and I used a square and a long ruler to cut it all to precise uh, dimensions and then it went in and it went in pretty quick. So here it is and it's all done. So another upgrade to the telescope that I wanted to make was an ability to cool the mirror from environmental temperatures after the telescope sits out for a hot day and you want to get it cool very fast so you can get down and start taking pictures right away. So I looked around and I found a company called Noctua who makes a nice fan and other people on cloudy nights have recommended this fan. And I picked a particular size of 40 millimeters by 40 millimeters in area and 20 millimeters thick. It turns out that's just enough clearance to clear the mirror uh, focusing threaded rod. Anyway, because of the way this is going to be mounted inside the telescope base, I had to build a bracket to hold the fan using the things that come with it, the rubber standoffs. But then I made this little aluminum bracket and it's got three holes in it that are threaded so that I can tie the fan into the wall of the back plate. And I put some bevels on the edge to make it fit a little bit better. And on that one side this is the in fan and on the other side is the out fan. So the air is going to flow through. and if you see, uh, this one is actually mounted and you can see that because of where it's placed, which is at the vent hole of the scope, the, uh, is right next to where the threaded rod goes for the focusing mechanism of the primary mirror. And so you have to make sure there's going to be enough clearance between the top of this fan and the bracket that holds the threaded rod on the primary mirror. And there is, but it's between one and two millimeters clearance, which is just barely enough. Then you have to power the fan somehow, so we put uh, a panel connector through for 12 volts, and I drilled those in a, I clamped the base plate in a vise, and then I just sized up the drill hole until I get to my half inch drill, which is actually a little oversized for this, but it works. But I did it one step at a time because with a hand drill, you don't want to have all of that torque on the hole immediately, so you want to come up a little bit at a time. And I also used some cutting oil when I did that. So as you can see, one of the fans is mounted and you can see how I tried to center it on the vent hole and then 
later when I reassemble it, the vent cover plate just goes on top like that. The other fan, I just show you how it sits in. It has a cutout at the base that matches a little pin in the base of the base plate. And so it's just going to fit in like this. And I'm just going to screw it in from the outside with some 3 millimeter by 16 uh, millimeter long screws. And that's how it fits. And then the plug plugs into the other outlet here for the 12 volt. And I get 12 volts for both of the fans. So that's pretty much all you have to worry about. Okay, so I was reading in the, the blogs and the forums in how you want to cool the mirror. And although the fan has an inlet on one side and an outlet on the other side, which gets a good airflow through the base of the telescope, it doesn't actually get into the cavity area above the mirror in the primary part of your OTA. So I decided that to help get uh, air exchange across the entire volume of the telescope, I would actually put some baffles inside the base of the telescope to block the direct flow from the inlet to the outlet and force the air to come up over the mirror and then back down the other side of the mirror to for the outlet. And that should get a better air exchange. So I custom made these little quarter millimeter thick aluminum plates and I'm going to put one in right here and I'm going to put in the other one right here and that's now going to block well this one's having a little trouble staying in place for now I'm going to glue them in later so now the air will come in through the inlet the mirror and those baffles will block the airflow across to the other side so it'll force air up over the mirror and then down over the back of the mirror and out the outlet hole. You have to make sure these little baffle plates don't hit the primary mirror. So they're custom cut to make sure I have clearance when the mirror is in the most recessed position. Um, so I, I have clearance now on the baffles and as I mentioned before clearance on the fan. So now the mirror can move unobstructed but I get a pretty good blockage of the air from the inlet side to the outlet below the mirror and I'm forcing all the air to come over the top of the mirror. So now uh, another upgrade we're going to talk about is that we're putting in an environmental station on the mirror such that I can measure the temperature of the mirror directly and compare that to the temperature on the outside of the telescope and the fans of course are then to cool the th system until we get uh, equal temperatures on the inside and outside but I have to be able to sense the temperature on the mirror. So I purchased this little environmental station from a company called Yachto Pus, which is a Swiss, a Swiss company. This costs about 60 bucks, but it also costs about 40 bucks to ship it from Switzerland. So overall it's about $106. Anyway, this is the electronics that drives the sensors, and this is the sensors which sense temperature, humidity, and pressure. So the way we're going to mount this is uh, it comes connected like this, but they say you can separate it and just solder the wires together. So I'm going to put the electronics on the base. So I have a little insulating plate where I, I drill two holes in the base with threads. And then we're going to put the insulating plate on the bottom, more or less like that. And then the electronics are going to just be screwed down. And so now the electronics are in contact with the base. And the way we're going to get connection to it is it has a little mini uh, USB port. So we're going to just plug it in like that gets screwed down to the base like that and so now we have the connection and it goes to the outside through a panel connector and this panel connector is a little bigger than the one I used for the fans so it uses a 5 8 hole so again the way I did the drilling is I started with a very small drill bit and just worked my way up to 5 8 got a nice hole and then screwed this panel connector in it so it's just a mini USB on the outside that then goes into uh, the computer for the monitoring of the temperature. On the other end of the wire is the sensor that is used for mount, or measuring humidity, temperature, and pressure. And I'm actually going to glue that to the back side of the mirror, which I haven't done yet. And I have a very long wire so that when I have to pull the primary mirror, I have room to be able to pull it out and then unscrew the base electronics from the base plate to be able to move it out with the uh, mirror. In actual fact, I just purchased another set of plugs so I can actually put a plug in the middle of this wire and decouple the wire sensor from the electronics without having to remove the electronics, which will be better. But I haven't quite got those parts yet in the mail. 
Anyway, so now we can actually measure temperature, humidity, and pressure on the back of the mirror inside the telescope and compare that to a weather station that I'll have outside the telescope. It'll be running simultaneously. And that's how we're going to measure the temperature and get some data for adjusting our cooling rates and seeing how well we're doing with the cooling. Okay. Alright, so we're actually just at the stage before we're going to start the reassembly, but we thought we'd give you a quick tour of where we, what we've done so far and how it's kind of wrapped up. So, as we explained before, we've uh, done some upgrades with putting in fans, putting in a thermal environmental uh, station, and some baffles. So, let me just go through that very quickly. So, we have the in and out fan. The out fan is near the focus control. It, they're now mounted and screwed into place, and we've connected them electrically. And the electrical connection, I've tied it down to the base plate with a urethane a structural adhesive, just to keep the wires from bouncing around when this... Um, telescope is assembled. Then uh, the environmental station has its own port which we showed before and I've wrapped the cable in such a way that it's also out of the way and not going to move and that's the electronics that uh, do the control of the temperature and then there's the cable that comes out and then goes over to the sensor which has now been glued to the back of the mirror using that same urethane structural adhesive and I went to some trouble to make sure the sensor Part of the circuit board is in contact with the mirror but we're not putting any stress on that part and we're having all the wire relief done through the urethane adhesive and the wire then runs underneath the bracket when it's in place and it will get plugged into the uh, electronic control. Uh, finally there's the baffles which we're going to use to separate the flow underneath the mirror and so the, mirror, the air will come in, <coughs> the baffles will block it from crossing at the base, and then it'll, so it'll force air up over the front of the mirror, and then it'll come back down behind the mirror again on the other side for the outside of the outflow. So those baffle plates, which are just quarter mil aluminum, have been also glued in place with this uh, structural urethane adhesive. All right, before our final uh, assembly, just checking that the fans are working, you probably can't hear, but air is coming out of that fan and air is going in on the other side. And also testing the environmental sensor glued to the back of the camera, uh, to the mirror. And we see here the output from the sensor and sliding the mirror back and forth doesn't seem to cause any issues, which it shouldn't if everything has enough leeway, and we're good. Hi folks, well, so it's been a year since I rebuilt the telescope and I've actually had an opportunity to use it now for a whole summer season in the fall. And so right now we're gonna try and summarize what I think uh, were the improvements and maybe where there's something left to do. Um, before we get to that story, I have to tell you about the shirt just so you don't spend the whole video trying to figure out what it is. And so it's uh, the lyrics from the song of Sounds of Silence by Simon and Garfunkel, which is my wife's uh, idea of humor. So anyway, back to the summary. Uh, so we did a lot of changes that have been just shown to you in the video and the changes I'm going to categorize how they impacted a performance in three groupings. So there's going to be first, how did I improve the drift rate of the mirror flop in the system and then what was the advantages of improving the my ability to measure temperature on the back of the mirror versus measuring the temperature on the outside and finally we're going to do some qualitative assessment of what happened when we uh, put the baffles and the fans in to try and break up the air stagnant air in the front of the mirror to improve the effective seeing of the imaging so let's talk about the drift rate improvement. So we did get a, a really nice drift rate improvement. Um, so the, let me just re-summarize what the changes were that we made. So we put these nylon screws in the outer baffle tube of the primary mirror to try and tighten up the motion between the, prime, the mirror motion when you focus and the inner baffle tube. I changed the grease to a perfluorinated polyether uh, grease, which actually is a very high quality relatively expensive grease, but is, is good for all kinds of temperature conditions and, and will be very long lasting and a better grease than what was there originally. And finally, we um, fixed 
a design flaw in the focusing mechanism, the motorized focusing mechanism of the Celestron system. So if I have to guess where the improvements came from, I would have to say that the fixing the design flaw of the uh, mo mechanism for the fo motorized focusing was probably the primary improvement that was achieved through this process. Um, the putting the nylon screws in may have had a small impact on, but I doubt that they were the primary factor or maybe even an important factor. And the grease was definitely a plus to do, but it didn't really affect the drift. So quantitatively, what did we see? Well, prior to the rebuilding of the telescope, I did some measurements. They weren't particularly great measurements in terms of controlling all of the aspects that I needed to control. And I learned later after the rebuild that I probably should have been controlling my measurements a little bit better. But the net of it is, is I was seeing a range of 60 to 96 arc seconds per hour drift in my images, which is really quite large when you're not guiding. Um, in some of my configurations of the telescope, in particular the one that you see here behind you right now, is an F2 configuration where dri uh, guiding is difficult to do through the primary mirror setup. So after the rebuild with the uh, improved design uh, fix for the motorized focus and the nylon screws in the baffle tube, I now have, have achieved roughly a 5x improvement on that 60 to 96 arc seconds per hour drift. That 5x is actually a conservative number. It's probably a little bit better than that. Um, in the process of doing all this, I learned, maybe for your interest, that um, when you're working at very low altitudes, your drifts become much, much larger. And so anything below 30 degrees altitude is a, a region where you're going to get large drift, whether you've made the fixes that I've we've described to you in the video or not. Um, so be aware that if you are trying to, to measure drift below 30 degrees altitude, you're going to see large drifts. It, it doesn't seem to be dependent so much on anything that I did to fix this machine, uh, the telescope, but it is still drifting quite a bit. And maybe it's because as the telescope is tipped over when you're working below 30 degrees that the mirror motion is uh, more sensitive. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the second subject area, which is the fact that I can now measure the temperature on the back of the mirror. Um, you know, to be honest, measuring the temperature on the back of the mirror maybe isn't the most critical thing. Being able to measure the temperature, though, is quite important, I've learned, uh, because of how it is relating to your desire to focus on a periodic basis and keep your system in focus while you're running through the night. So what did we do? We put, I mounted a little environmental uh, sensor system on the back of the mirror with some glue and primarily what it can do is measure temperature and humidity. It is true that it measures air pressure as well, but I haven't found a particular value in that. Um, and what I do is I use the temperature reading from the back of the mirror and compare it to a temperature reading to an equivalent uh, environmental sensor on the outside of the telescope. And you can see that right there hanging off of the base of the telescope is my external uh, thermometer system and the inside one is the one that we've shown you in the video that I mounted on the back of the mirror. So there's different ideas about whether measuring the temperature of the mirror is the most important thing or measuring the temperature of the OTA is the most important thing or just measuring the air temperature is the most important thing. And I think at the end of the day, what I've learned is measuring the temperature is the most important thing. And where you measure it is less critical because it still gives you a, an ability to progress through the evening and refocus according to the change in temperature during your imaging. So in my case, since I'm measuring two temperatures, I'm actually seeing how they change as the night progresses. So just before sunset, when I turn the system on, I'm measuring a temperature delta of the thermometer on the mirror and the thermometer hanging from the outside of the scope to being between five and seven degrees Celsius, which is nine to 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that seems like a large delta and it always kind of made me nervous when I first started to see this, but now as I've gotten used to it, I don't think it's such a big deal. And by a roughly two in the morning or so, um, the temperatures equilibrate to being the same temperature. So what that tells you is it takes that many hours, between six and eight hours, 
for the mirror to actually uh, accommodate and equilibrate to the outside air temperature. So, uh, so what I do with this temperature reading that I get is I set the, my software system up such that every delta T of one degree Celsius, I do a refocus. And what I found is that that refocusing is, at that rate, is actually quite uh, useful and, and probably what you need. Now, so whether I'm measuring the temperature of the mirror or the tube, because you might argue that the temperature of the tube and its expansion is affecting focus more than the temperature of the mirror, they're both moving downward together during any given evening. And I'm finding that the one degree delta uh, uh, is a, my criterion for refocusing off the mirror temperature is certainly capable. And the reason I say that is when I just do a repeatability uh, measurement on my focus, I find that my focus counts are plus or minus four counts between two focuses that are done immediately one after the other. That's, uh, for those who care, the four counts is roughly um, three microns of motion in the mirror system. Um, at the imaging plane. Um, so now when I do this refocus, uh, every one degree change in temperature, what I'm finding is that the range of uh, focus changes is between four counts and 16 counts, which is between three and 12 microns motion of the mirror. Um, I find that later in the evening when the temperature is not changing, but I'm just refocusing every 45 minutes to an hour just because I set that pace in there, I'm seeing refocus shifts of about 16 counts to 20 counts. So in actual fact, I'm focusing often enough when I'm changing temperature that my changes in the focus are smaller than what I get later in the evening when I'm just trying to reset the focus just because the system has been tracking the sky for an hour or so. So now we're going to summarize the potential gains or the actual gains I got from the last subject area. Uh, so I did a fair amount of reading before this rebuild because I wanted to understand if there was any things I could do to improve the seeing of the telescope. Um, seeing be one of, is one of our biggest um, issues when we're trying to do good imaging and anything we can do to improve the seeing should be beneficial to our image quality. So what did I do? So the first thing I did is I added flocking to the inside of the OTA, which probably didn't do much of anything, but it was convenient and uh, it wasn't very expensive, so I did it. And whether that has any impact on what I'm gonna say about the quality of the imaging, I, I don't know and I pretty much doubt that it does. The other thing that I did is after reading about how uh, stagnant air in front of your mirror can cause uh, seeing problems due to the thermal gradients that get set up inside of a sealed uh, Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, I said, okay, based on what I read, we need to find a way to break up this air uh, that's stagnant and, and make it turbulent. And by making it turbulent, we will have less uh, distortions according to the problems of optical seeing. So the other things I did is I put the aluminum baffle plates underneath the mirror to try and direct the flow from the fans I added such that it forced air to go out in front of the mirror, break up the static air, and then come back down to the back of the mirror and be pushed out. So the main reason for the fans was to be able to equilibrate temperature faster than you would otherwise get from just having it sit. But in addition, I wanted to try and take advantage of the airflow because of the fans to break up the, the static air in front of the mirror. So I don't really have a good quantitative assessment of what this did. Although I feel in a qualitative sense that this actually did make a pretty significant improvement. And let me just describe what I observed and, and why I think that's an, an improvement. So what you can do is uh, defocus a star, a bright star, to a very high extent. And when you see optical or dynamic optical turbulence, which is maybe not a correct term, but it's the term I use to describe the distortions you can see in the highly defocused star, which looks like a donut, but there's all these waves passing through the, the uh, intensity of the, of the donut. So if I defocus a star right after or right before sunset, and uh, before I've actually turned on the fans, I see lots and lots of distortions going across the image of the star. And so these are waves of black and white that, that pass across the, the stone uh, defocused star. After running my fan system for about an hour, 
Um, and now the, the delta T between the mirror temperature and the outside temperature is still significantly large. It's greater than three degrees typically. But now the, the optical turbulence is completely quieted down. And so I almost see, not perfectly, but I almost see a, a, a uniform uh, white donut in terms of my defocused star. So I conclude from this that by having the fans on and by forcing air to go out in front of the mirror, I have broken up the static air in a way that I get enough turbulence that I've actually now improved the, the effective optical seeing of the air column that's just in front of the mirror out to my uh, corrector plate on the front end of the telescope. So I think that's made an improvement, but it's very difficult for me to give you a hard number or a quantitation of this uh, improvement. So that sort of wraps up um, the summary of what we think we improved in this rebuild of the telescope. If you ask me, what would I do again if given the chance to rebuild the telescope and what I wouldn't do? So I probably wouldn't do the nylon screws again. It is a pretty dicey operation. It wasn't that I couldn't do it, but I'm not sure the benefit for the effort and the risk of uh, damaging something in the system was probably higher than the benefit has proven to be worth. The thing that played the most, or had the most impact in the drift correction is really correcting a f design flaw on the Celestron motorized focusing uh, device. And had I known that before I tore down the telescope, I wouldn't have torn down the telescope. I just would have fixed this design flaw. But it turns out I didn't actually discover the design flaw until having torn the, the entire thing down and wondering why it was uh, coming together the way it did. The other things I would say were quite valuable, although you can have a, th a thermometer on the outside as well as on the inside. I like having it on the back of the mirror. I don't know that I would have torn down the telescope just for that purpose, but now that I have it, I'm very happy to have it. But I think you can manage with a thermometer any, pretty much anywhere hanging off of, this, of the telescope or mounted onto the tube. The baffles in the fan are harder to judge whether they have made a major improvement, although I, I'm pretty confident they've made an improvement that I like. And again, would I have torn down the telescope just for that purpose? Probably not, because it is possible to buy fans that you can mount on the outside of the telescope, so you don't actually have to tear them down to get the airflow. The baffling on the inside you can't do without tearing it down, and I think that's provided me with some improvement, but I don't know that it's worth the effort of tearing down the telescope to do it. So, kind of to wrap this all up, my advice to you is probably don't tear the telescope down unless you want to do all of these things in one shot and check the mechanisms of your mirror, in primarily the focusing mechanism of the mirror and in the case of the Celestron, the motorized focusing mechanism of the mirror. And you can make some pretty significant improvements if you have one of the mechanisms that's the design flawed mechanism. I believe that Celestron has changed their designs recently to potentially correct this on the new products they sell. But there was certainly a period of several years where the, the product had this design flaw and needs to be fixed on any uh, system that, where it is. I would like Curtis <laughs> to show you a picture that I've taken uh, to demonstrate that with this system you can take very high quality pictures. Whether the quality of this picture is the result of all of the things we did or it's just the, what you can do with this system is, is up for you to decide. But uh, I think the picture will speak for itself in terms of the quality that you can achieve with a system like this. And hopefully the things that I did uh, played a role in giving, having this picture be produced. By the way, this picture is going to be the Orion Nebula that I took uh, this past fall under an F2 configuration of the telescope, which is the way it's set up right now uh, with a hyperstar in, re in place replacing the, the secondary mirror and the camera hanging off of the end of the hyperstar. So the camera we used was the Zuo uh, 294 Pro uh, color camera, one shot color. So here's the image Dave took of the Orion Nebula after doing all the upgrades to his C11. And he took 190 minutes of 30 second subs and 38 minutes of 5 second subs to deal with the core of the Orion Nebula. And then he did processing and PixInsight.
to blend the subframes to get the high dynamic range. If you found this video useful, please don't forget to like it. And you can always subscribe to see more videos like this. And you can also visit my website, californiaskies.com, for more astronomy content. Thanks for watching and hope this video was helpful.